Welcome to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast with me, Phil Aston. And on this episode, I'm delighted to have with me Zal Clemenson, guitarist from Tear Gas, the sensational Alex Harvey band, Nazareth, Elkie Brooks, Bonnie Tyler, Majeur, Thin Dogs, and his latest venture, Orphans of the Ash. Um, I recently on the Now Spinning Magazine YouTube channel and website did a feature on the Alex Harvey band Next, um, one of my favourite albums from that period, and it got thousands of views and lots of people from all around the world started talking about it, how special it was to them. So I'm absolutely honoured to to actually find myself now talking to Zal, the guitarist <laughs> from, from that album. Uh, so welcome, Zal, and thank you for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure, Phil, and I really, um, I really enjoyed your review of the next album that was kind of why I got in touch with you in a sense, because it was... Uh, it was such a heartfelt and 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 in depth review of the album, and it pretty much summed it up as well. Thank you. Now I know that your early influences were people like Chuck Berry, and you were also interested in people like Richie Blackmore. But I've also read that it was Frank Zappa's guitar style that made you hmm. think, right, I'm going in that direction. What was it about Zappa's playing that w- w- made you feel? Was it like um, a relief to let go of all the Jimmy Pages and Blackmores? Something about <laughs> Zappa's playing? Yeah, I mean, the the early stuff, as I say, were, were all influences, but you know, in a very a very particular style, rock yeah. guitar, if you want to call it that. Um, from Chuck Berry on, was everybody everybody that that I would imagine uh, playing guitar play the guitar, not unlike Chuck Berry. You know, yeah. it's one of the first things you learn to to do, and 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 that kind of noise, but. Um, when I heard Zappa, it sounded like he wasn't really connected to anything to do with that style of or that world of, of of cliche, if you like, rock guitar playing. Yeah. He seemed to play the guitar with a kind of freedom um, and a kind of improvised sort of style that, that 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 just bent all the rules and everything was out of shape, you know. And I thought, yeah. wow, what is this guy doing? And 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 how is he doing it? Because it's it's quite fascinating to watch Frank Zappa playing the guitar because your first impression is that he's that he lacks technique. Yeah. And he's just simply making things up as he goes along. But when you take the time to analyze it as as his son Dweezil has done, you know, with the, taking the, the, the music to the rest of the world, when you analyze what he's playing, you realize that there's a great musicality to it. Uh, that you don't really get the first time. You just you just hear the strange stuff and you hear the the crazy notes and and you think wow. But of course his his education is 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 steeped in classical and jazz uh, music anyway. So there's there's bound to be that sort of influence. Yeah, because he was uh, the scales you were playing were very not like the obvious blues scales, were they? So it it, it sounded yeah, very it, alien, it, didn't it, to what was going on at the time, really. Yeah, obviously the atonal thing and the sort of parallel fifth idea of, of you know, composers, the original composer who brought it all together with Stravinsky uh, and people like that. He also was very keen on a composer called Edgar Varese. Yeah. Um, so, yes, making use of making use of those sort of scales and those sort of harmonies um, changed everything. Stravinsky, as I say, changed everything for, for, for music, really. And everything yeah. you hear nowadays, every 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 soundtrack to a movie from the, the 1910, 20s onwards uh, owes its owes its owes its debt to to Igor Stravinsky because it's just it's just phenomenal. And then and you know we we dipped in with Saab, we sort of listened and we tried to dip into a bit of that at the at the time when when um, we were doing the Rock Drill album, we had. Uh, 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 the different keyboard player who'd come to join Tommy Ayer had come to yeah. join us, and Tommy himself is very steeped in in, in some of the classical and jazz. Sort of, his right. big influence was uh, was Bella Bartok. Yeah, and he would he would sit in the rehearsal room and just play Bartok on the piano, and we wow. would just we would just sit there open mouthed, you know, and just try. Yeah. So he said he kind of he showed us a few tricks and a few tips and a few sort of scales and things that we tried to put into the Rock Drill album. Um, 
And uh, and it worked. It works. It works really well. It, it translates quite nicely when you play it as a, as with a, with a rock sound. You know, it's a yeah. It's a very uh, underrated album from the Alex Harvey catalog. I mean, when you your first band um, Tear Gas. I mean, when I, I I was I've been playing um, obviously Orphans of the Ash a lot before I, before this interview, and mm-hmm. it almost feels like you you're going full circle. I mean, Tear Gas is a very, was a very hard rock album, not as heavy as obviously Orphans of the Ash because of the technology and the guitar sounds and everything, but there's a yeah. still a feel. There's still a, an aggressive feel to those first, first two albums that you did, especially the second one, actually. Yeah, it is. I mean, I've said that to a few people who've asked me that, yeah, it feels like kind of full circle in a way, going back to with the guitar being the, the most prominent instrument yeah, uh, sort of dominating and, and sort of riff based uh, rock and metal, you know, kind of kind of music with, with Sab. When Tear Gas sort of met, uh, sort of morphed into Sab, a lot of the influences came from the keyboards, and a lot of the songs were, were keyboard sort of driven initially. And 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 yeah, it was all good. It was all great. But for me personally. Uh, it kind of, it kind of, the guitar kind of took a little bit of a back seat at times. Um, again, perhaps producers and production techniques that sort of come into it. But yeah, so it was, it was nice to kind of when I decided to to put Send Dogs together. It was all based upon just let's get a guitar to the fore, and then especially now with the uh, Orphans of the Ash. There's only myself and Billy McGonagall. We both play guitar, and we play guitar very similarly. Uh, so there's a kind of emphasis that, that you know it's almost 100. percent It's it's just guitar, yeah. bass, and drums, and that's and it's kind of now that we've started work on the second album, it's beginning to show up even more now in that kind of kind of a raw, you know, raw and un, un, kind of un, un, uncluttered, uncultured almost sort of style of, of it, production. Well, I, I mean. Uh... I'm going to jump around a bit probably in this interview, but I have to, yeah. while you've mentioned that, uh, Shed My Skin, which is uh, from, I guess, the new album. Um, it will be, yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's just, um, it's just a fantastic song. The, 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 um, the riffage, <laughs> the guitar yeah. sound is so heavy and, and, also, the um, the version obviously that I've heard came with a video. That video is amazing. Um, that's been put together behind that. Yeah, well, we stumbled. We've been trying desperately to to find a way to accompany tracks with a piece of video. Yeah. Without you know, without going to Warner Brothers or, or, or Steven Spielberg, and it, it um, and we stumbled on a piece of software called Kyber. Yeah. Um, which is AI generated, obviously. Oh yeah. Um, you pay a little subscription, etc. So we just messed about with it. We, we we played around with some of the ideas. It's quite basic, but you feed it enough information, oh, and it, it, spit out, it spits out a video, and you just kind of go, "Wow!" You know, and it was, yeah, well, it, 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 it works. It, it, works. it, it work, works. Yeah, it works really, really well. Um, going back to as Tear Gas morphed into the Sensation Alex Harvey band, and you're talking about some of the songs became more keyboard driven. I mean, some songs like um, Saint Anthony from Framed mm. is a really heavy song, and I, I always wondered whether that was kind of something that was from the Tear uh, Gas years, or was it written no. as the Alex Harvey band? No, it was a song Alex himself had. He he really? had that song. Yeah, yeah, wow. he had that song already, already, already written as part of the. This the framed album. He was all the songs he brought to the framed album. Uh, it it sounds like it sounds like to, it's a really heavy it song, isn't it? Great riff. Um, it does. It does. Yeah, I mean, it's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite songs in, in, in lots of ways because it does have that that uh, that you know that powerful guitar. Oh, sort it's of brilliant. Phrase. It also has that yeah. um, great lyric. Saint Anthony was all alone in the route of a two tone chocolate biscuit, which I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, surreal, surreal lyrics. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think Alex, Alex, Alex had a way of seeing the world that was so different to anyone else. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, I think he had a slight, a slight style of. You know, we often hear David Bowie uh, about his lyrics when he chops up. You know, he chops up words and throws them around the floor, and then picks them up yeah. and sees what what happens. I wouldn't say Alex was quite in that vein, but he 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 he, he had a he, he read a lot. He had a great library, and he was very keen on on historical uh, references and so on, it's particularly 
some some of the the, the books like uh, the Tarzan books where there was a kind of yeah. a, oh, a yeah. kind of a hero a hero figure involved and it was a kind of sense of adventure and and so on so he was he, I think that has has influenced them yeah well my I got into framed after hearing next and for a lot of people of my generation it was the old grey whistle test in 1973 um, staying up late, um, got school the next day <laughs> and got so used to seeing bands all looking roughly the same and, you know, it was album-based bands. And then Alex Harvey band appears. Uh, didn't know who you were, <laughs> what they were, uh, what it was. But everybody in the playground the next day was talking about, did you see the sensational Alex Harvey band and those two songs, The Faith Healer and Next, in that particular session that you did. Mm. Were you aware at the time that when you that was your, I guess, your first real TV exposure in the UK. That something may have shifted from doing this. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that the fact that we that we were on telly, you know, to us that was like a real kind of step forward. We, we thought, wow, this is, you know, that that's what happens to you when you become successful. You know, you, you tell yourself that this is what you go through, and to be on the television was an, an absolute buzz for it for for all of us. And 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 it's and in a way it was the, the perfect excuse to to present yourself and kind of uh, put on put on a a show if you like you know because the, the band is obviously as you say very visual very theatrical um, uh, thanks to Alex's his direction and, and mainly from his kind of driving force his sort of focal point so yeah it 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 it, it fell into place quite naturally for us uh, because. It was a medium where we could we could show ourselves off effectively. You could look at a camera, you could you could express yourself, you could run around, dance about, whatever you want to do, make a face, you know, express yourself in that way. Whereas a lot of bands, um, you know, with tear gas as well, in particular, you would just stand there with your head down, play guitar, and and be mean and moody, and that kind of sap kind of completely knocked that on its head. Did that did that theatrical side of the band? Because obviously this is seventy three. hadn't been together that long at all. Um, mm. Did that was that part of the premise of the band coming together with Alex almost immediately? Did he actually say this is not going to be a normal rock band, guys? We're going. This no, is it, 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 it wasn't explicit. It, it, but but with tear gas, we had a we had a, a, a strange sense of humour. One, one it, it, there was a show we played. This this it, it was called the. Uh, 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 a club in Glasgow called the Electric Gardens. It's now known as the Garage, and it's quite well known as, as a sort of a rock venue at the moment. But in, in early tear gas days, we played there sort of on a regular basis. And um, what we did one night was we decided that we would play one half of the show as tear gas, and then we went back to the dressing room, shaved our beards off, changed our hair dressed up like a 50s rock band and called ourselves Johnny Rocket and the Zoomers. And we came <laughs> wandering back on stage and half the audience had no idea that it was the same guys. <laughs> so that was the kind of sensibility that we had. So we had a, you know, we had a fairly good tongue in cheek um, approach to it all. So when Alex, I think Alex picked up on that, Alex picked up on the fact that the band liked performing and liked like to be theatrical and visual, and so he he just he just brought that out of everybody in a, in a way. Because the other part, obviously, Alex was the the focal point, but um, not that far behind him was was yourself. I mean, because again, so used to that back in that again going back to that performance and how I was and where I was in my musical development, mm. seeing this guitarist dressed as a clown. <laughs> Looking quite sinister, and the way you moved, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, that was obviously your. What What was the inspiration behind that? And was it? Did you feel more comfortable being behind a kind of a mask in a way? Well, the the, the thing about the mask was um, was brought about by when I I had a habit of when I play guitar, um, I always found that the guitar hero, the image of the guitar hero, I found it quite amusing. Um, the angst that was involved in playing a guitar solo, the stance, the posing, the agony in the face, all <laughs> the sort of all of that I found quite ridiculous. And I thought, well, I'll just send it up, which is how I started off. I just started off playing the guitar as if it was here's a guitar hero, but I'm not taking myself seriously. 
<clears throat> and what happened was, as the venues got bigger and bigger, our manager, Bill Fahili at the time, said to me, look, people at the back of this hall cannot see what you're doing. They cannot see all of that. So let's see if we can find a way to project. And we tried a few different things, and we, we, we played around with things. We actually, was in New York. We went to see Marcel Marceau, the famous mime, mime artist. Yeah, yeah. And that's really where I took the the, the, the idea for putting the white face and, and developing it so that it would project further into the hall. And, of course, it became a trademark, and it worked really, really very well. It certainly did. Now, the, the album next, the production of that album still sounds as fresh today as it did then. You know, and the guitar sound, I mean, the way that the guitar solo, for for example, comes in on Vambo. It's mm. it's in your face, but it's like it's it's balanced within the sound stage as the rest of the music. But it's mm-hmm. such a because again, thinking back to other rock albums of the time, everything was kind of almost in the same frequency band, really. But the way that mm. that album was mixed, it sounds amazing. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on the production of the album? When you were you at the time thinking? this is going to be good. No, well, actually, it's strange you say that because for me, I thought from Framed, I thought moving to the production on Next, I thought became a little bit, for me personally, it became a little bit too glossy and mm. a little bit kind of, um, a little bit lightweight. But obviously, it was Phil Wayneman who was brought in yeah. to, 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 to produce that album simply because he'd worked with bands like Sweet and Mud or whatever else he worked with to, you know, it had hit, basically it had hit singles, had hit songs. And I think there was a, there was at the time a, 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 an emphasis on making the band sound commercial, as commercial as these other bands sounded. So you were kind of, and I felt we get dragged towards that uh, to, 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 the, to the detriment really of the bands over I know you I know you're saying that you you really dig the dig the the, the production but for me I, th- I still think it could have been a lot heavier but um but there you go you know the, the funny thing for me was that at that time the competition at that time for me wasn't sweet or mud or or God forbid Gary glitter the competition for me was Led Zeppelin mm-hmm. and Pink Floyd and deep purple that's that's the kind of band I wanted to be heading in, but we kind of got dragged into this the uh, top of the pops stuff. You know, it was all kind of it just it it it, it, it didn't really it didn't really sit with me comfortably, to be honest. I think your guitar sound though is is uh, I mean thinking about at the start of uh, the Faith Healer, obviously when the riff mm. the riffs come in, and then the the two in, the guitar overdubs come in when it's ready for Alex to come in, and you did yeah. that again on Action Strauss uh, as well that kind of chug 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 sound. It's just it's you. But the other yeah, thing I think yeah. that, that sets you apart it, from the other guitar heroes, as you were saying, how the guitar heroes were, I almost felt as as the development of guitar and rock music came along that it became more about the guitarist thinking, right, this is the end of the second chorus now. This is my moment. So there's going to be a solo and I shall pour as many notes into it as I possibly can. <laughs> your, your, your star was that the the solo was part of the character of the song. It was perfect. It was like structured, not as if it had been f- plopped on on the top of it afterwards. It was part of it, as if like, as if like the the guitar was coming out of the voice or whatever the whatever the lyrics had been yeah. about. Your guitar yeah. matched it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That 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 you've pretty much summed it up. That the the Phil. That's uh, what Alex would say was, you know, when the vocal stops. Whatever takes over has to speak in the similar way. It yeah. has to take. If there's no vocal, then who? Where's the emphasis? Where's the where's where's the attack? Where's the where's the focal point? And if it's a guitar, then for me the guitar was the voice. The, the, so almost, not all of my guitar solos, but I would say at least eighty percent probably were all improvised, um, just off the top of my head in the studio. So. So it was just a case of of thinking to yourself, what's going to fit? What's going to fit this song? What's what's going to fit the narrative? If you like, when the vocal stops, you have to say something. You know, you've got to make a statement. So it felt to me like that's what I, that's what I, how I approached it. You know, was to make a statement. Uh, if you got it right, you got it right. If you hit a few bomb notes, you might. Well, okay, we do it again. But you know. Generally speaking, it was it was it was an improvised sort of situation. 
Well, I think your playing also is not just about a game which makes you such a, a great player, is that it's not just about the solos. It, it's about your chord structures and your songwriting and the it is the riffs. So again, thinking of um your latest project, Orphans of the Ash, on the mm. on your on your twenty twenty two album, you don't so much notice the solos as a separate entity. You just notice the the the, the riffs and the song structure and the arrangements. You know, which is obviously again, it's part of the guitarist world, which I think a lot of people just think of a guitarist like uh, waiting for the solos. But your whole and again with Alex, it's the you're playing throughout the songs. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, you're right. I mean, the the, the Ellipsis album, the, the the Orphans of the Ash, the first album, Ellipsis. We um, we approached it with a with with with. We came at it from 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 sort of different sort of viewpoints in, in terms of we wanted it to be kind of atmospheric, but we also wanted it to have a rock edge. But we also wanted it to be, at times, kind of use the word cinematic, uh, soundtrack, film. You know, so so where there was there was texture, there was there was there was atmosphere, there was tension. Um, so you've, you're trying to you know as guitar players, you're trying to. You know, I don't play keyboards. I can play, make a noise and get some strange effects and all that. But so that's how Billy and I approached it. We tried to make the album as expansive as we could, simply because of the way the songs were beginning to develop in the music. And it was like, well, okay, is this a song or is this a piece of music? Or you know, are they do, are they two standalone things or do we put them together? So that was that was a very interesting process for us. It works on some occasions. Other occasions, I think it's a little bit where we, we sort of miss the target occasionally. But overall, it's not bad as a as a first production. I I, I, th- I, I agree. I think it's very cinematic. Uh, the opening track, Evolution Road, is as very kind of dystopian, uh, mm. mel- melancholy. Um, it sounds like it. You could imagine it in some kind of dystopian sci fi movie. The guitar sound when it comes in after that almost gentle beginning is just in your face and so well recorded um yeah it's a it's a great album um i said we'd be jumping around in this interview <laughs> <laughs> um uh, and just popping back to uh to, to alex i mean after next that was when the band really took off and i think living through the 70s like we all did um i think the only thing missing then was mtv um in in respect to the fact that alex harvey band was such a visual and um, theatrical band <laughs> That if you if you if MTV or or that kind of medium had been around YouTube, then I think Alex RV Band would have been like one of the biggest draws on the planet. I mean, because you were so visual, nothing really exists, does it, to show that off to people apart from Top of the Pops and a few. Yeah, few yeah. MTV there's there's, there's, a, there's, a, <clears throat> there's some various footage from here and there and everywhere. There was one that was done for America, which we did at the Rainbow. Yeah, uh, the Rainbow Cure, which was I think it was Don Kirshner or some sort of in concert type thing or something, which went out to the states. There's some footage from a couple of festivals, one in particular from the Ragnarok, I think, in Norway. <clears throat> so yeah, there, there, there is there is some footage. There's some footage from the the Marquee, I think, as well, a version of St Anthony that you mentioned. Oh, great. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's there's little snippets of the band, but not not enough. That can't. I mean, we did we did. One of the one of the tours we did of the UK was was became known as the Christmas shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was done at that time, which was five five nights at the Apollo in Glasgow, and I think it was four nights at the Victoria in London, somewhere like that. Um, all sold out, so it was quite a it was quite an event, and it was quite a production um, in in terms of the stage and the and the the. the the, the visuals and all that, the theatrics and so on, and it never that 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 would have been that was for me the band's pinnacle. And if that that why that wasn't filmed and why that wasn't videoed, or, you know, however you did it at the time, was absolute. That that was just sacrilege. It was just yeah. you know. Well, yeah, and, yeah. And you're right. I totally agree. I mean, the band was becoming more adventurous with the Impossible Dream and Tomorrow Belongs to Me with um, Give My Compliments to the Chef, um, The Great Stone Eater, etc. These are all mm. songs that would have been fantastic. You imagine videos being done nowadays. Um, and, of course, you had the mm. live album, which should have been a double. Um, yeah. At, at least. Yeah, a lot, of people, a lot of people reckon the live album is the best. But, you know, the favourite the favorite album. And for me, production-wise, it's, it's, it's excellent. Yeah. 
Uh, totally. The um, Pentaz tapes, which I had a lot of cover versions on, was that, a, can you remember, was that like a deliberate thing to think, let's do an album with covers, or was it a kind well, of like... <clears throat> no, well, thinking back now, um, I think it became, I think it was the time around about when Alex's health was perhaps not great. I don't know, there was various other things that had happened. Um, I'm not sure of the complete timeline, but but we had a we had a contract with the record company, obviously, to spit out. I think it was you know like two albums a year or something like that. Yeah, ridiculous, really. So it was it was it was kind of nonstop. It was a kind of conveyor belt of you know writing, recording, touring, rehearsing, etc. And I think what really happened there was that probably Alex had run out of some ideas. You know, we were short of ideas, and and we just had to complete a, a kind of a contractual. So it was, it was, it was maybe just pick some songs, and Alex picked some. I think we all had a sort of hand in it. For me, it was all a bit kind of. It didn't quite. It didn't quite work for me. I didn't see the point of doing, of doing a version of Schools Out that wasn't really as good as the original, or a version of Crazy Horses even that wasn't even as good as the original. So it was, it, it was a, it was a bit of a stopgap, I think. Yeah. And um, and you're right. It didn't. I, I don't think it. I don't think it really advanced us in any way. Yeah. No, and I think the the the, the light was starting to dim a little bit. Unfortunately, because obviously stories which came out, I think afterwards is a is a very strong album. Uh, Boston mm. Team Party is on it, isn't it? Um, and it's one of mm. my favourites from from the band. Um, <laughs> but as you say, Alex's health was starting to wane, and then and Hugh the, as well. Hugh Hugh was. She suffered a, a extreme breakdown just before uh, before we started to do rock drill, work on rock. Do, on. do you so, think was that that was that because of like literally how you were being worked by the record company and the management back then? I think I think in that yeah, in Alex's case, I would say yes. In Hugh's case, it was more to do with sort of early adventures and taking acid and things like that, and and uh, he, he never quite recovered. I don't think fully health wise. Um, you know, mentally, psychologically. Yeah, yeah. Well, Alex, I think Alex. For me, Alex went downhill when Bill Fahili, our manager, was killed in a plane crash, and and there was nobody in charge of right. Mountain. The management company just completely fell to pieces. The band's finances were completely and utterly destroyed and decimated, and you know the whole thing was completely mismanaged extremely badly. And I think Alex didn't really recover from any of that. And he just, you know, he took himself to his own room after gigs. You know, he was dragging a bottle of vodka from the dressing room, taking it away into his bedroom. And it was all that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah. It, was, it, was a, it was almost a classic kind of a rock and roll kind of yeah. trip. And when the band unfortunately did fold, I mean, the, the management were obviously – Keen to try and keep something going, and that's where the the the, Z- the Zal band came from, was it? But that didn't last very long. <laughs> no, again, it was ill-fated. The whole mm. thing was just a an attempt to keep some sort of momentum. Um, the record company weren't sure what they should be doing. It was just, well, who's next in line? Like you said earlier, Alex. Mm. Well, who's next in line? Oh, Zal, right? Okay, you know he's he's got an image. Let's see if we can build something around that. And it was all. It was and so the music was 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 actually quite remarkably interesting at times because I, I went back to my Frank Zappa roots and started to write stuff oh, that yeah. was a little more a little more involved, more complicated, uh, more jazz, more time signatures. All the whole thing was uh, more fusion. So it was uh, it, 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 musically, it, it kind of was cool because Ted and Chris were obviously still involved, and it was and it was. But 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 yeah, as as a, as a project, it was it was uh, extremely disjointed. Because around this time, you mentioned that obviously the finances were all over the place, and I think you you had to get like a normal job to keep things ticking over um, mm. during this period. And yeah. I think a lot of people don't appreciate that when you're a musician, you don't necessarily get a, a regular monthly paycheck. Money arrives yeah. randomly depending on what you did two years ago. So this must well, have been very difficult. For you know to mentally get well, your head I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you the whole truth. I mean, when we first started, when when Tear Gas became the Alex Harvey band, we we, we each of us were earning a hundred pounds a week, um, mm-hmm. and then that quickly, fairly quickly, that went to two hundred pounds a week. 
And at that time, that was fair enough. It paid yeah, your bills. Quite, yeah, there's a lot decent, back then. It was a decent enough, decent enough wage. So we never saw any royalties. We were never given any songwriting royalties, uh, PRS, PPL, uh, mechanicals. We never saw any of that. Uh, we were just around two hundred pound a week, and we thought, right, okay, that pay, that pays the bills. And as you say, up until the time when the band split, that's what we were earning. Um, the money that had been brought in from the record sales and and, and, and so on. Yeah. We never saw that. The management company took it and pissed it away somewhere. I don't know. Oh, when, yeah. when, 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 when Mount Management went into liquidation, our management company, we were each, each of us was sent a letter from a solicitor to say that each of us owed the company £75,000. So this is a wow. band that headlined the Reading Festival and et cetera, et cetera. And then we're all sitting saying to ourselves, how come, you know, with, you know, anyway, you get the idea. I get the idea, yeah. I get the you idea. Know, so so when it's when 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 it split up, I, I turned around to my wife and we were living in North London. Uh, we had a baby in, at the time as well. And I, and I turned around and said, well, how, how, where am I going to earn 200 quid a week? So I says, oh, I'll drive a minicab. I, been in enough minicabs in London to realise that you could drive 12 hours a day and make, make a bunch of money. And that's exactly what I did. Just a local yeah. radio radio company, you know, a car company. Wow. Um, and <laughs> for, from there, you obviously, Nazareth were next on the list. Did you join, I mean, you made two, from my perspective, two fantastic albums with Nazareth, No Mean City and uh, Malice in Wonderland. And I love them both, mm. but... This was must have been very different for you because you were coming out not wearing your mask from Alex Harvey, so you were just being Zal on stage. Did what was your experience mm-hmm. looking back on that now, being in Nazareth? Well, the Naz guys were, were part of the same management team. Uh, yeah, they, they were. They were under. We were all under the same umbrella, Mountain Management, as it was. It was known. They, they kind of, in a way, sort of owned the company, I guess. Um. And so we knew each other extremely well. We were all pals. We sort of, at times, we would share the same flat in yeah. London. When they were away, we would stay in the flat. When we were away, they would stay in the flat. But, um, and then we had an opportunity. We were asked by Manny and um, uh, Roger Glover to to play on Dan McCafferty's solo album. Oh, yeah. Um, so we all went in, all four of us from Saab, and became the sort of studio band for that. Uh, which was a nice album, nice songs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that was where the first connection was made. And then I got a call from Manny, um, you know, the late 79. I don't exactly know when it was to say, well, what are you doing? Would you want to come out? We're, they were recording No Mean City in a, a mobile studio on the Isle of Man. Uh, again, tax reasons. But, um, and I thought, and they said, would you want to come over? They said, do you want to come over and see what we're doing, hear what we're doing? I yeah. said, yeah, okay. So I flew over to the Isle of Man. Listen to who, and I think at that time they were looking for a bit of input, looking for a bit of songwriting input, you know, to just sort of maybe spread the spread the music a bit yeah. more and, and develop the music a bit more. And I had a few ideas been lying around. Um, obviously, I, I never stopped writing, so I took a few ideas with me, and they just sort of got, they got they got they got you know they ended up on the on on that particular album, the No Mean City album. So yeah, that was it. Was a kind of I, I kind of fell into the position in a way. Uh, and then they, you know they flew me out to America to see, to see um, just how big they were, I guess, in, in a way because they were playing like stadiums and things like that. And it was a bit of an eye opener. I thought, well, wow, you really, they'd really had a big success with Love Hearts and, and a couple of the other Hair of the Dog albums and so on. And uh, so that was a kind of way for them to try and sort of say, look, you know, they entice me into this this world of stadium rock. And I thought, yeah, okay, why not? I'll just yeah. And, and then that I just I just fell into it really. And so when you, because Malice in Wonderland was a different type of album, different sounding album, um, mm-hmm. and you 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 wrote some, you know, co-wrote and wrote some great songs on that record. But soon after that, you you decided this was not really where you wanted to be. What was what was it that, yeah. that made you wanted to move on? Um, <clears throat> well, with, with with Malice in Wonderland, it was the, with the, again <laughs> recorded in the Bahamas again, tax reasons. And yeah. uh, Jeff Baxter from from Steely Dan, the uh, uh, Doobie Brothers, he produced the album. He turned up and turned up in the Bahamas with a sack full of cocaine and just produced oh, right. the album, and that and that was one of those scenarios. <laughs> but anyway, it um, it was all right. It was all right. It never struck me as being something that was. It, it seemed a bit lightweight in terms of a production for me. But anyway, 
Yeah, and, and then it got to a stage where we were all back home and, you know, we were up in Dunfermline, up, but the guys lived in Dunfermline. I was living in London and I came up and and they were saying, right, okay, we're, we're, we're going to be starting another album. We need the material. And I thought, yeah, okay, well, who's going to provide that? And they all just, sort of, I felt they were all looking at me mm-hmm. saying, yeah, well, you're going to come up with all the songs, aren't you, Sal? And I thought, hmm, really? Yeah, and... Because again, it was like I was on a wage, and it was not. I you know I wasn't getting any royalties. I wasn't getting any. Oh right. It was so. It was all. It all felt a bit like, nah. It's time for me to. Time for me to get out of here and um, and take my ideas somewhere else. And the next place you went, and I actually bought this. Everybody was huh. Tandoori cassette. I remember wow. buying the. I remember buying the single. Um, <laughs> I know it was only a blink of an eye, um, but it was. It was there. Um, was did you have? Um, big uh, high hopes for that but um what was it was very different to what you'd done before yeah yeah it was barry barry barlow the drummer from Tull. we toured the, we toured the states supporting with, with sab we toured the states supporting yeah. jethro Tull for an entire tour and we got to know the guys really well and um and it was barry who got in touch with me to say would well, you want to come down here this house down in henley by the river near the studio in his garage and all that it was a bit of nice uh, rehearsal sort of room with a kind of studio and he says you want to do you want to do you want to try and put something together and we said well, so it's, yeah why not he's a fantastic drummer a great player um and we started to put lots of interesting ideas down and we brought in ronnie Leahy, the keyboard player that i knew from scotland Oh, from yeah. way back, we played with Stone the Crows and and various other people, and then there was Charlie Tumahai, the bass player from Bebop. Uh, from Bebop, Bebop yeah. Deluxe, who, who was a, a Maori guy from from New Zealand, and great musicians, all great musicians. So musically, it was really very very interesting. The songs were were interesting. There was a kind of a the kind of hints of Peter Gabriel, who's one yeah, of my, yeah. my probably my most favorite my, my most favorite songwriter of all time. So there was there was influences that were that were nice and it was it was going quite well. But in terms of a, a project, in terms of a, an image or a band or a, or a, or where does this band sit in the scheme of things, we felt very much out on a limb somewhere. You know, we never really felt that there was any there was any kind of commercial powerful commercial uh you know the way of putting yeah. it all, 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 all on a on a paying a paying basis you know well i guess that as you say it must be looking for some kind of steady financial income as well and your your next kind of um turn was to go to elkie brooks and then Mijo and bonnie tyler and, mm. and these th- did these c- collaborations influence your musical journey because it must be very different style of music or is it just a case of you playing what was if you weren't were you involved in any aspect of writing or was it just no, doing the two no, yeah it was it was it was pretty stuff. much a session gig really uh, you know i approached that as a session musician you know just like show me the tune i'll play the part um but no there was with lk there was a little bit of flexibility even though her, her, uh her, her music at that time the songs at that time were, were very much geared to a to a kind of a more of a, I don't know what the word for it is, slightly sort of softer, you know, approach. She'd 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 moved away from the, the vinegar Joe, the sort of real yeah. stuff. She still had um, there was still room. F- yeah, there was still yeah. room for guitars though, because she she'd had Jeff Whitehorn had played with her, and yeah, it? Jeff, yeah, yeah well, so. Jeff, fantastic. But yeah, that I took over from Jeff, and that was oh, right. He left all these parts for me to learn. So <laughs> I thought, yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. And he made a, he, he did a very he did a beautiful arrangement of Nights and White Satin. Yeah. Which helped him made a fantastic job of. And there's a great, great guitar part in that. She also yeah. did money, the 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 the, uh, the Pink Floyd track money, which was yeah. cool, you know, and there's a couple of other little blues things that we did that were nice. I wrote a song for her called Minutes, oh, which yeah. went on the which was this title song from the Minutes album. Um so yeah, so there was there was there was a, a great deal of enjoyment, and she's a, she's a wonderful lady to work for. As was Bonnie Tyler; they were both. Yeah. The funny thing about Bonnie was that we never ever played live. She just played to a tape and sang. We just stood on stage and jumped about like uh, like really. Dummies. Yeah, everybody says that. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah that's that because <laughs> when I first got when I first got the chance to to do the gig, I was sitting at home learning all these part these guitar parts, which are pretty. They're pretty heavy duty at times with with some of Bonnie's the Jim Steinman yeah. production, you know. So here's me at home learning all these guitar parts, thinking, "Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be great." And when I turned up, 
to the first rehearsal. It was just the tape they put on, and we just stood there without just mimed well, everything. Well, I suppose it took was the pressure way, off. <laughs> that's the way. That's the way it went. That's the way it went for a couple of years with her. You know, it was just crazy. How interesting. Well, I know. Well, I was with Midjur. This is a question from uh, one of my subscribers because um, the I think Midjur's album, The Gift, is being reissued this year. Yeah, and it comes with a. It comes with a live disc from the tour, and um, and uh, my subscriber actually saw you on that tour, and, and he asked, wanted to know what was your thoughts on 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 playing with Midge? Uh, what was it like? He actually says your playing was just absolutely superb. Well, it was again, it's very structured. It's very, it's very, you know, it's very much you play the you play what's what's written down, you know. Yeah, and there wasn't there wasn't a great deal of scope for for anything to be. To be bent out of shape or improvised, as 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 it was, you know, with other bands. Um, but Mitch himself was a very accomplished guitarist, you know. So the guitar parts were really pretty slick, and they were pretty nicely done. Um, and we enjoy. I mean, we when we met, we'd never met each other. But when we first met, it felt like we'd known each other all our life. We both come from Glasgow, and we're both kind of you know similar, similar sort of background. So it, it was it was. Um, it, it was it was a really nice time, and then the music, okay, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit poppy for me in, in places, but other places, other times, it was, it was, it was really cool. It was, it was, it was nice to do. I mean, you know, the production that he that he wanted from a live situation was very slick. It was very, um, very polished, very professional, and Midge himself was was absolutely superb. So yeah, it was, it was no hardship, you know. <laughs> And then the 90s is a difficult time for lots of musicians from the 70s and, and 60s because it, there was so much going on um, in, in the world, really. And for yourself, you I think you had to, again, look at different ways of um, bringing some money in. Um, mm. But towards the end of that, the return of the Sensation Alex Harvey band appeared. That Was that a, because of all the bands that when they reform and they lose a key member, it was called Alex Harvey and Alex mm. Harvey was no longer there. So mm. did did you think at some time on paper, I'm not even sure we should even be thinking about this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's exactly how I thought about it. But Ted was Ted <clears throat> Ted McKenna, the drummer, yeah. was he had a sort of a bee in his bonnet about kind of keeping things alive and keeping the memory and also and, yeah. and trying and he tried to get me back. You know, I'd, I'd stopped playing for quite a number of years. Uh, hadn't played the guitar at all for quite a number of years. And Ted was back; had moved back to Glasgow, and I was just about to move back to Glasgow as well. And so we kind of he says, "Come down, well, let's just knock things around, see what we can do." And 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 it kind of snowballed. You know, we did some Im, Im, impromptu gigs with a bass player called Alan Thompson, who's played with John Martin and some various people. Um, uh, but yeah, so we kind of started to get into that sort of guitar fusion jazz thing, which was cool. But and then Ted said, "Well, maybe we can roll this into something else," and it became a kind of a, a regular gig in, Gla in a little Glasgow club in the south side yeah. of Glasgow, with like guest musicians. Fish came and sang, Dan came and sang, and this guy called Stevie Doherty got up and sang. Yeah. Uh, he was a Glasgow a Glasgow singer with a fantastic voice, fantastic <clears throat> voice for that type of you know stadium rock. What yeah. we would call, I don't know some people call it cock rock, I suppose, but um, you know, in the Bon Jovi type sort of. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, uh, foreigner sort of vibe, uh, which has never appealed to me greatly. I have to say, but the thing was that Ted said, "Well, well this guy's a great singer. Maybe he could be the maybe he could be the new Alex. We'll put him in front of the band." And so we. Put together a kind of a version, a, re a revamped version of Sab, uh, rekindled that, and with Stevie Doherty singing, and we did a few gigs. We did a gigs here and there, um, but we realised eventually that it was the wrong person, the wrong persona, you know, and, and perhaps even the wrong voice to to be to 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 to, to take over yeah, from Alex really nice. or even try and, and try and do that, and then so that that drifted and fell apart, and then again. I think there's a few years passed, and then Ted came back to me and says, "Look, there's another guy in Glasgow called Max Maxwell, um, who's very visual, um, very theatrical." And we had a rehearsal with him, and I thought I loved Max. I thought he was fantastic. I thought this guy's got something, you know, he had personality, and perhaps not the greatest singer on the planet, but 
he had something about him. You know, he had a very visual, very you know, very sort of theatrical sort of presentation. And it was his enthusiasm that that forced me in the way to say, "Yeah, okay, let's do it." And that's when I decided to get dressed up and put the put the face back on again. Yeah, um, it was a, re- a revamped face, wasn't it? As well, a different, um, more. Yeah, 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 yeah. We changed it. We changed the look of it a little bit to give it a bit more of a modern kind of a sci-fi sort of look. But um, yeah, so yeah, that 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 was another another attempt at at, at being sad, and it got as it got so far, and it played certain places, and we did did a cello gig at the ABC in Glasgow, which was cool. But again. I, I was desperate to move on, you know. I, I, what I wasn't wanting to do was become a, a, a clean. It was, was become a, a parody of myself, and I felt that that's what it was, you know. And I tried to introduce like, here's some new song ideas, guys. Let's try doing some fresh new songs. And it was like, oh, it was like it was just met with like mm. almost zero enthusiasm. And I thought, bugger this, I'm not. You know, I'm just not going to. I, I didn't want to go up and prance about dancing Delilah for the rest of my life. Because yeah. it was, it just felt, it just felt like, nah, that's just static. It's, it's not going anywhere. It's not doing anything. Is is that when you announced it, uh, you were, you were going to retire from live performances completely around two thousand? Yeah, it was. It was, it, it was about that time. Yeah, yeah. There was various other things going on in my life. My marriage was falling apart. It was all a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a bit of a traumatic sort of experience. And um, I met another woman, etc. Like we. I moved back down to live in Yorkshire with this woman, and um, and so on, and that 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 lasted about fifteen years. Only a couple of years back that we split up again, but but yeah, so there was there was a lot of a lot of personal things going on, a lot of emotional things happening at that time. So I wasn't really fully focused on anything. Did um because obviously it's a big. You've gone through different parts of your career when you've literally put the guitar down and not pick mm. it up for a long time, and as mm. I know as, as a musician you. The, the pilot light never goes off. It's it's a <laughs> somewhere in the background. A good expre- you, very good expression. Good metaphor. As, as much as you think, I don't. It doesn't bother me anymore. As as rusty as the guitar strings get, the pilot light's still mm. on. Um, so at some at some point, did you see that music could actually be part of your healing process to get back to? Well, to it's funny you use it. It's it's very interesting that you use that word healing. Because as I say, when I met this other woman, we moved, she, her job took us out to Cyprus and we lived in Cyprus for three and a half, four years. Yeah. And um, and during that time, I suffered an extremely serious uh, mental breakdown um, mm-hmm. due to depression and anxiety and so on. And, and it was uh, it was just, well, it was horrendous, a horrendous time. Yeah. And I thought to myself, right, well, you know, I need to do something. I need to do something. I need to get out of this. I need to find a way to, to, to heal myself, as you say. And, and I thought, right, I had an, a little acoustic guitar with me, nothing else. I picked it up, started strumming the guitar and, and just to see where it would take me. And, of course, it, it, things began to snowball a little bit. I started to get ideas, started to feel it was songs, some guitar riffs. I bought a lot. I went along to the music shop in Limassol in Cyprus, got myself an electric yeah. guitar for right. 100 quid, got a little Black Star amp for 100 quid, plugged it in, started playing some riffs. And it was, it was, it was, it was a process. It was like therapy. It was therapy. That's what yeah. it was, you know. And I, and and then I started to feel that you know there was something happening here. And I got in touch with a. There was a band in Glasgow who who played like a sub tribute band actually. Yeah. And a key with a keyboard player called David. Uh, oh, can't remember his name. David. God, I'm sorry. Anyway, I got in touch with Dave. Dave. Dave David, and, and uh, asked him Dave, if he David wanted. Cowan was it. David Cohen, yeah, yeah. Dave, David Cohen, and asked him if he would like to, you know, to do add some keyboards, do some recording, you know, with some of these ideas. And we, I was in Cyprus, he was in Glasgow. We were passing things back and forward uh, until eventually, it was, it was, it was beginning to sound interesting enough to, um, to try and put a band together around the the, the whole idea, and that became a band called Sin Dogs. Mm, yeah, um, yeah, and we did a we did a kind of an album that was okay. And because that that almost sin dogs becomes um, orphans of the ash, doesn't it? In some ways, the yeah, 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 kind of yeah. Morphs. And also during this time, you've decided to write a post-apocalyptical book novel called Rule. Is that is that still? <laughs> yeah, it's in the back burner at the moment because yeah. the, the music has kind of taken. But yeah, I've been writing a, writing this novel for quite a number of years now. Yeah, it's called Rule. R O O L. Yeah, it's yeah. Set, in the, set in the future. It's kind of about evolutions, about things. 
<clears throat> evolving, creatures evolving, insects evolving, and humans trans, you know, morphing into whatever. <clears throat> so it's quite a freaky sort of story. But and I've got a couple of the first chapters already completed, but I, I need to get back to it. I need to organise it. I need to get my brain in gear and just get myself, you know, kick myself up the arse and, and, well, and spend, uh, some, spend well, some time the, um, doing it. The shed my skin video kind of links really well into whatever you whatever you fed into the AI system. I can obviously see where that came from. Yeah, there. you use well, you used the word earlier, dystopian. You know, the whole thing, Dyst- the whole planet's becoming a kind of a dystopian nightmare, I guess, as we speak. But isn't it just? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, 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 that the Ellipsis album is sup- is superb. Um, That's you know, good to hear. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Uh, Ratneck, Psychodrama, Blind Machine, Starship, uh, Baby Boo, Jesus mm. Strange. I, I don't, there's not a bad track on it. Some of it's really heavy, isn't it? Really um, almost yeah. trash metal in places. I mean, a lot of yeah, musicians yeah. kind of mellow <laughs> as they go through life. Uh, well, but, but you, yeah. you're, you seem to be raging against the machine and heading in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, again you've, you've, you've picked the right band as well there, but yeah. Yeah, Willie and I have a tendency to to lean towards, you know, having a an attitude to, to playing the guitar that never really sort of never sort of wanes. You know, there's that has to be, and we just love that that style of rock music. I guess. I mean, our our, our musical tastes are very very similar. And in fact, you know, the favorite music for me, the favorite bands that I that I would listen to now would be bands like Radiohead and Soundgarden. Mm-hmm. You know that that's the two bands that have had the biggest influence on 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 the on the Ellipsis album yeah. for me. There's more grunge than metal, but it's um, but it's still yeah, it's still a, a noise you want to make. You know, you want to plug that guitar in and hear it screaming and 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 thumping away. So yes, yeah, well, it never that- leaves you. So tell me about the the, the next one then, because obviously I've I've heard the a, 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 you know forthcoming track. But I mean, what's the mm. the, the new album? What what are the plans for when is that going to be finished or coming out? Yeah, I would, we'd love to have it finished by the end of the year. Um, mm-hmm. We don't we don't have a lot of time to work together. The studio is in Billy's house uh, on the west, just near where I live as well. We live quite close to each other, but yeah. Um, but uh, he he's out cutting hedges. He works for the council. He cuts grass and hedges and you know, yeah, yeah, central roundabouts and central reservations and things like that, just to make you know to pay the yeah. bills again. It's one of those situations. But um, so when we get together, yeah, we 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 work pretty swiftly. Um, but the approach to really is to even strip things back even further than than ellipsis is to get back to an even more very very. Basically, you know, like let's have one guitar instead of double tracking. Let's just have one guitar do the job, and see where we go with that. So that's how we've kind of our mindset at the moment is to 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 strip everything right back to a, almost to a kind of a you know I not say white you know like white stripes are a kind of a prime example. With that. Again, um, uh, the Royal Blood again is a sort of prime example yeah. of of things being stripped right back to the bare bones. But the noise that comes out is extremely uh, pleasing. It so is. we're kind of we're kind of working along those lines, if you like. You know, Who, who's uh, who's playing bass on the ellipsis? I mean, the they're, bass... they're, they're electronic basses and drums. They're oh, just, are they? It's, well, it's, it's, it's a it's a wonderful industrial. Yeah, that's sound, it's called easy it? easy drummer and easy bass, <laughs> and they're like plugins. You use it with Pro Tools, you know, the recording software Pro Tools. Yeah. You you just plug in this this well, module and it, and it spits out a drum kit. You've got to you've got to program it, yeah, and program yeah. the bass. But yeah, but yeah, the noise is is fantastic. Yeah, fantastic sound. You mentioned about you know your, your writing partner and he has to do other things and, and stuff. The music industry has changed so much over the years, um, mm. and it, for, for musicians now to try and earn a living, etc. I mean. How, I mean, what are your thoughts on like streaming and you know stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not that kind of clued up on the technology of it all, but but yeah, it's something. It seems to be the only way that you can get your music out to the public is to just, you know, the, when we did the Ellipsis album, we said, well, here's a CD, and I thought CDs. It seemed like it seemed like we went back to the dark ages, you know, p- people. But it's funny because most of the pe- people that follow me on Facebook are probably of a, of an age where CDs is exactly what they want. They don't want it to download. They want they no, want the I, physical they want the physical product. And yeah, with all but the, I, you know. Yeah, I, well, I you know to 
to give you some background, I mean, on for mm. my subscriber base is probably aged between thirty and sixty five plus, and yeah. they all they they do stream, but they use streaming to discover and to listen. But then, if they like something, they'd like to buy the CD or the vinyl album directly from the artist, um, yeah, because yeah. people like to have that tangible bit of art yeah. in their hands because you're closer you're closer to you um as a as a creator of the music than you would be by just pressing a file name to see what it sounds yeah. like yeah absolutely in fact that you've you've you just mentioned the vinyl there again we are there's a company in sweden who are doing a vinyl version of ellipsis as we oh speak. really yeah so oh. that'll be out within weeks i would have thought it's, uh, it's what i've been told is it's going to be ready within weeks well that's really um, exci- that's like, really exciting um yeah a short run it's a short run i guess yeah, but, but know, they were very very keen yeah um so yeah so that will be they had to cut down the track lengths obviously to get things on the vinyl we took out jesus strange and so i you know the, the slower sort of songs we took them out to give ourselves uh, more yeah, space to, to, running to, time yeah yeah yeah. Um, so yeah. So the vinyl idea is 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 cool, but but the, the point you made was that there's not a lot. You know, there's no money to be made really unless your 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 profile is 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 massive and huge. It's this is you know, and people keep asking. You know, on on Facebook they keep saying, "Oh, are we going to get live shows from Office of Ash? Are we going to get live gigs?" You know, and and it's Billy and I, Billy and I look at each other and think, you know. The, putting together a band it's 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 not out of the question but it's but it's it's let's say it's the last thing in line put it that way i think from my pers- my perspective i talk to quite a few up and coming bands as well is that a lot of people and a lot of rock fans are from a certain age and nice i'm one of them uh, we have mm. there's a tendency for 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 some of us to to look backwards to look back to you know um back to the, the the glory days of how we perceive them as being like these classic albums in this certain time and mm-hmm. then we don't we the, the new music the great new music which is hiding in plain sight mm-hmm. um, by the same artists that we loved we don't we're not aware of or for new bands who are struggling to break through we're mm. not we don't even we're not even aware of it and i think you know we're reaching, we're reaching a point now where you've got lots of older artists who are either going to retire or mm. other other things will happen to them you know and we mm. need we need mm. to support new music from musicians young and old and i think you know what i want to try and hope for this is for those of you watching or list sorry listening is to is to listen to this ellipsis album by orphans of the ash because you will love it it's absolutely yeah. stunning yeah, i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more with <laughs> everything you've just said you know it's yes yeah. we need to support uh, music as it is now you know it's 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 it's, it's where the it's where you where and how you present yeah. your product how do you get that product to the right audience um i don't know i just i don't know television uh, video uh youtube uh, yeah youtube probably well, i would say yeah, um yeah. I, I think your your little video of um shed my skin needs to needs to be out there it's brilliant anyway well but you've yeah, got gonna, sorry yeah, you've got go. he's got such a a legacy as well there's a guitarist called guthrie govan who plays with stephen wilson <laughs> and yeah. he describes you as his his jimmy page I mean, how does how does that make Flattering. you feel now that you've had such an effect on well i've had i've been to see guthrie playing and uh it's flattering for him to even mention my name in, uh, in that in that sort of light but um but yeah i mean i thought yeah okay but obviously at his age at that age and um, when he was first hearing perhaps led zeppelin and T- it's you know tear gas or whatever or sab yeah. etc there was um i mean jimmy page is a big hero of mine obviously from way back but um yeah, very, very pleasing because of the style of guitar player that he is, is a style of guitar playing that I kind of drifted into when I mentioned to you before about the fusion, the jazz thing. Yeah. And we were working with the at the tail end of uh, rock drill and we were moving into certain things. And Ted and I were playing in Glasgow together. It was mainly fusion type guitar instrumentals, you know, the Jeff Beck style yeah, or yeah, whatever, yeah. And Guthrie Govan style. So... So yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of compatibility there, and a lot of uh, and I can and I can, I, 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 yeah, it's, it's 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 cool to be mentioned in that way. It really is. <laughs> well, fantastic, Zal. Well, thank you very much. But before we before I sign off, where's the best place for people to buy 
the the Lipsis album and Orphans of the Ash? Is it is it from directly from your website? Well, okay, the website is down for the time being. Okay, uh, we've just dis- we've decided that we can't afford the website, so we're going to go. S- we've just about to switch over now to just uh, social media sites. Okay, so a, a couple of, we have a couple of young lads in Glasgow who manage all our affairs. They're putting together the package now to relaunch, as it were, on the on the the media sites, um, social media. They want to relaunch Ellipsis along with the the free download of Shed My Skin with the video as a kind of tester for what's coming. So that package is is in the process of being built as we speak. It will be ready within a week or two. Okay. Well, in the meantime, I'll put a link to the Orphans of the Ash Facebook page. That's the um, one. That's the one where it will appear. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll I'll put a link to that um, at the, the in the description in the podcast and on the website, so people know where they can go and find out more about how they can buy a copy of the previous album and look forward to the new one as well. Absolutely. That'd oh, and the great. vinyl one, of great. course. Yeah, be... great, Phil. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, th- well, thanks very much, Zal. Thank you, and thank you to everyone who's been listening. And uh, please remember to. Check out Orphans of the Ash on the Facebook page where you can find about where you can buy the CDs and please subscribe to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast as well. And a big thank you to my guest, Sal Clemenson, for joining me today. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. A big thank you to my guest, Sal Clemenson. What a guitarist and what a, what a musical history this guy has had from Alex Harvey, Nazareth, Elkie Brooks, Bonnie Tyler, Mujer, Sin Dogs, and his latest project, Orphans of the Ash. Everybody, I know we love Alex Harvey, I know you love Nazareth, and many of us want to love those stories that Zal's been talking about, but please support his latest venture, uh, Orphans of the Ash, an absolutely incredible heavy metal, grungy, metallic, music album full of absolute total 100% riffage um it's dystopian it's melancholy it's absolutely superb and listen to it ellipsis on on spotify there's going to be a vinyl version out very very soon and the new album is out soon as well and also the single shed my skin which is off the new album give that a listen as well and trust me if you're into rock music you will love it so thank you again, Zal, and please keep a check on Zal's Facebook page to see what he's up to, and please subscribe to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast and YouTube channel, become a patron, become a member, and I shall see you and hear you and talk to you on my next episode. <laughs>